you know, unlike people like Ned or others, um, I'm a generalist. And I do that because, to me, when you're looking at a lot of environmental problems, um, there's not enough people who really look at the big picture and actually try and look at all the different things that are going on and actually link them all together. Um, so, over the last several years, I've moved away from doing really detailed sort of research on one particular site and try to look at the, what's happening all together, right across the industry, you know, whether it's gold mining, uranium mining, coal, um, but also look at some of the impacts on uh, things such as uh, groundwater, um, surface water and things like that. So, uh, there's some things there where I'll certainly uh, overlap a bit with sort of the information that Tor was going through and, and Ned, but I really want to try and keep it on these high level questions and it's really, I suppose, that sort of approach. So, now the first thing, I often start a lot of my presentations with cartoons, but because I think cartoonists have a great sense of reality. And I think one of the big issues for me that I think is still lacking in the whole debate about um, coal mining, CSG, um, is really, well, if we're actually about getting energy, then we don't need to look below the ground. We should be looking upwards. I think, for me, I think when you're looking at truly sustainable energy options and the, the context around climate change, um, I think we should be doing things like base load solar thermal plants, uh, wind energy efficiency, and a whole bunch of things which actually meet out the needs we have with uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and so on. So I think cartoonists, and this is a very old cartoon, but it's, um, again, how you frame the questions and actually asking the right questions I think can be really, really important. So I'll talk a bit about um, you know, coal seam gas and so on, and you know, sort of follow on from sort of Paul's work and presentation. Um, I'll talk a bit about some of the, the common environmental concerns. Um, I don't necessarily have the same ideas or um, uh, as say some people do, but I'll try and talk through some of those. Um, I'll focus a bit on the groundwater because I think to me that's one of the biggest long-term issues that uh, you know that we need to understand a lot better. And as a Melbourneian, you know, spending most of my life in, uh, uh, in Melbourne, um, we Melbournians, we don't understand groundwater. Well, we don't understand the value of groundwater. Um, and it's people here in Buckalden, it's in Longreach, it's in uh, Birdsville, um, Alice Springs even, where people live on groundwater. The communities and um, the, the springs and a lot of the environmental values simply wouldn't be there if it wasn't for groundwater. So, so for me, I think one of the messages I've always sort of learnt whenever I've travelled around is just how valuable that groundwater is and why we need to be very careful about the long-term um, decisions and uh, manage of that. So one of the problems I've found in looking at um, coal seam gas over the last several years is, although there is a lot of work being done, that there hasn't been a good enough independent regulation. There are some CSG projects that don't even monitor groundwater and yet they still turn around and say there's no impact. All right, and if I tried to do that in a scientific paper where I said, look, there's no impact, but by the way, there's no data to prove that, um, I'd get laughed at. So to me, I think there's um, the, the research and a lot of the regulation has been a really key problem, and I think that's um, you know, where some of the uh, debate's up to. I'll go through this pretty quickly, but you, know, you can talk about coal seam gas or natural gas, and really the, the phrase coal seam gas is to distinguish it, that we're getting the, the methane the gas out of a coal as opposed to, say, an oil and gas reservoir. So it, you could say it's um, natural gas or things like that, but really we're talking about methane. Uh, and historically in coal mining, of course, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a hassle, it was a problem. It still is. And so there are some coal mines now that go to great effort to actually drain the coal of methane first before they actually go in and do, say, uh, underground mining. Um, and it used to be just vented out to the air, these days, of course, it's a resource that we can capture. All right, so, for some sites, in say the Hunter Valley and, uh, and elsewhere, they'll actually extract the, uh, the gas um, before, say, an underground mine goes through. So, relatively straightforward. Now, I'm actually glad, I was worried that Tor might have a slide in here like this. I'm glad that um, Tor doesn't. But if we look at the conventional on the, on the right-hand side, and often because of the high pressure involved in an oil and gas reservoir, um, methane, once you sort of drill into that, it uh, can be released much more um, uh, readily, I guess, and that then the amount of water gradually um, grows over time. And then there's a balance economically between how much water you extract and how much gas you extract. So that might be the picture that applies to um, sort of sites like Moomba and, and so on. Um, but typically, you know, sort of Ned was uh, explaining as well, we're dealing with things that I often like to use the bag of marbles approach, because if you can imagine a bag of marbles, the water and the gas is basically in the gaps in between all of those marbles. So 
which is the same when we're talking about the Great Artesian Basin and the, the, the sandstones or the, the sedimentary layers that we call aquifers and we extract groundwater from. Um, that's often that image on, um, on uh, your right there. Now, if we're looking at coal seams, uh, coal is not necessarily always just as straightforward as a bag of marble. Sometimes it might be cracked. So you can see the little, sort of little um, you know, planes in there and, and so on. Um, often it's sort of quite compressed. So, and as sort of Tor was saying, we've got to actually uh, release a lot of water first before we can actually get that methane to start flowing more freely. Sometimes the coal, the, the cracks and the sort of fractures in the coal might be enough to allow um, flow, you know, once you start removing the water. Um, in other places, of course, the coal seam is far too tight. And same with shale gas as well. And sometimes that shale is so tight that it just doesn't allow the gas to move at all. And so, which is why you do the hydraulic fracturing to create those cracks and then allow the flow. So typically, um, th that might be a sort of graph where initially you don't get much methane, um, and as you remove a lot of the water, the, the water pressure um, reduces, and so then the methane can start to flow. Now these are just some photos and, um, from the, uh, the, the Gladstone uh, LNG or you know, CSG project. Uh, and just to give a sense, and I think one of the things that I think has certainly surprised um, you know, landholders that I've talked to and you know, communities I've visited is that, and I think the industry is sort of starting to realise that a lot of the work that goes on, that normally historically for a coal mine you drill some bores, you'd then do an environmental assessment, get your approvals, and then all the large scale stuff would start. With CSG, there's a lot of um, much larger scale work that goes on, and as sort of Tor was saying, with the appraisal stage, um, long before you even get to a full scale production stage. And so that, I think, has been one of the key weaknesses in the way that we've done uh, um, some of the regulation, is that most of the public consultation and the decisions about large scale activity, um, well, we're already doing a fair bit of that at, you know, um, at, the, at the appraisal stage. So, that's a, a, a key challenge with the way we, um, I suppose, do environmental regulation and, and so on. And again, you could look at this bore and you can see the, the infrastructure that's there, but it's not just one bore, of course, there's, there's many. Um, and there's potentially going to be tens of thousands in Queensland. And it's all the other infrastructure that attaches to this. And one of the, the key problems that people like Ned and, um, and myself and others have is, that's the easy stuff. We can see that on the surface. The really big questions around groundwater are all below the surface. And when I've been teaching groundwater now at Monash for several years, one of the sort of the, the messages I'm constantly trying to get students to understand is you're taking one point in space, so you've got one bore here, and then you've got to extrapolate that over maybe 20 kilometres or more. You're also taking samples in time. So you've then got to sort of look at how those, you know, how the groundwater is going to be behaving over time. And so and then try and predict what's going to happen into the future. And so when you're looking at groundwater behaviour, we've got to take points in space, points in time, and then try and predict what's going to happen over a much larger scale, a much larger area, um, and often over time scales of decades or more. And so even though you can look at some of these things and some people say, oh yeah, but it's, it's a really small footprint, but what's going on underground is actually a much bigger footprint. And that's the, it, that's the challenge that we've got, is to understand what that footprint is. Now, if we look at these, these are sort of, the, the, I suppose, the most common environmental concerns around CSG, ignoring this debate about energy in the first place. But um, I think there is a real debate about whether there, there is compatibility between farming and CSG. You know, it might be possible, and it's certainly, um, you know, some farmers are, are happy with it, and there's, um, some aren't. But one of the other issues is surface water impacts as well. There's, uh, I know there's photos up on good old things like Facebook which show floods going right through some of the drilling sites and so on as well for CSG. Um, and I know from you know, talking to the landholders that uh, have taken those photos that they were told not to drill in the floodplain and the company said, oh, well, it'll be fine, trust us, and of course then a flood comes through. Um, whether there's some, you know, what we might call toxics or other things in the water, there's salts, there's um, sometimes natural things like, say, the benzene or toluene and others that are, can be extracted from the coal um, you know, with the water as well. So all of these things we've got to actually make sure we're monitoring and we're assessing very well. Right. Um, when we're talking about groundwater, um, one of the other things which we can't forget about, of course, is not just where the groundwater is, like how much and the quantity of that groundwater and the pressures involved. We also need to be worried about the water quality as well. All right. So. Uh, and I think when you look at a lot of the information that's out there, it's at the moment people have focused a lot on, say, water levels and, and the, the amount of groundwater, but hasn't been as much work done on the quality side of things yet. So, um, now I, I think, 
when I've looked at the industry and I've looked at some of the environmental impact statements that have been done for some of the projects, I think there's still a large weakness in the amount of data that underpins a lot of the claims that are made. So I think to me that's a, that's a real problem. You know? So when I'm making a, a prediction about you know, groundwater impacts from a particular mining project or something that I know could last for 50 years or more, um, you know, I would like to have a good bunch of data to underpin that. And it is being done. You know, um, one of the sites in New South Wales that doesn't even monitor groundwater is now having to do that. So, whereas in Queensland, there's general, there is a fair bit of monitoring that's done, but it hasn't really been put into the public realm. So, we'll come back to that point. I just thought I'd use this, and we, um, there's a lot of talk about how much water's involved and so on. Um, we can see the sort of the, uh, the, the, um, the brown line in there that's got the sort of the pedigules on there, sort of Tor was saying. So there has been a good strong growth in the amount of coal seam gas that's being extracted in Queensland. Uh, we can also see the blue line there, which is the amount of water that's uh, extracted as well. Right, so you can then say, well, one divided by the other, and you can come up with an, an average. So for every petajoule of coal seam gas, um, you get close to about 100 megalitres, or maybe 100 uh, Olympic-sized swimming pools. So, and that number will go up and down based on our previous graph because it depends on how old a bore is or how new it is and so on. But um, if we look at the, the, the blue line and the brown line there, at the moment, of course, they're about to grow very, very rapidly. So the volumes of water um, will become much larger in the future. Now, these are some older photos. This is uh, one of the water ponds that, um, you know, sort of used for evaporation of that water. Um, and of course some of the early concerns with these sites, of, sites have now led to the um, system now where CSG projects have to treat that water instead of actually uh, evaporating it. Uh, um, you can see a, a sort of salt storm here, of course if you evaporate salty water you're left with salt. Um, you know, many parts of Australia where that's an entirely natural process and we have you know, great things like Lake Eyre and, uh, and many others. So, but for a lot of parts of where CSG is operating, these salt systems are not normal. They're not a natural part of the environment. So, um, from a management point of view, it's one of the reasons why the industry is now going down the pathway of water treatment as opposed to evaporation. Now, I want to spend a tiny bit of time on these graphs because this is actually, these are quite important. Um, this is from one of my students last year who um, looked at a lot of the data that's um, now starting to become more publicly available for coal seam gas. Now, if we look at the, the, uh, the top graph there, we can see the little blue diamonds. Um, then we can see that you go back, you're looking sometimes of 30 or 40 years worth of groundwater data that's been monitored. And we can see those blue diamonds there where the water level has gone down, then it came back up, and it's gone back down again. Um, and that's, in some ways, that might be drought related, it might be over extraction, um, it could be when floods go through and you get nice big recharge events into the groundwater, but it gives a sense of actually the, you know, the, how the groundwater is behaving over time. <laughs> We can also see on the top graph there when uh, the coal seam gas uh, field started and we can see that there was a very rapid decline in groundwater. And in some ways we can look at that and say well look there's a historical record where maybe that's happened in the past as well when there was no CSG. Um, but clearly there has been some impact from CSG at this site. It's, um, so not hard, it's actually pretty easy in some ways to put some of this data together. But the thing that's always surprised me is when I've gone through some of the environmental impact statements, it's all about predicting the future. And I think, as Tor said, the industry's been in Queensland now for well over a decade, and the industry and government um, have not been as good in actually just putting this basic data together and say, well, how accurate were the predictions 10 years ago? What's happened over the last 10 years? What has actually been the impacts on groundwater? And put the data together and say, well, look, we can predict things well, or that, well, actually our predictions are always slightly out or sometimes we actually predict things will happen and they don't. I think a lot of that basic sort of science of actually doing that, of actually looking at, you know, prediction 10 years ago, look at operations over the last 10 years and say, well, what's happened? How accurate were those predictions and what's actually happening? I think that's one of the weakest um, links in the way that the CSG industry has been working. Now, if we look at the, uh, the bottom graph here, you can see the sort of the... Again, the sort of same sort of pattern where you can see a general decline in groundwater levels. And that may be, again, it may be due to drought and lower recharge getting into the, uh, into the groundwater systems. Um, it may be from over-extraction. There's a bunch of groundwater systems around Australia where we take far more than actually gets in naturally. And so that's not a sustainable way to manage groundwater. Um, but again, we can see the sort of the blue sort of diamonds on the right-hand side there when the CSG field started up nearby. And yet there's no change in groundwater. And people look at that and go, well, that's proof that CSG has no impact. 
well, over the data that we've got so far in terms of the, the last five years, then sure, it's had no impact yet. And one of the problems that people in groundwater you now face is the long time scales that we're talking about. If you look at some of the rocks that um, Ned showed before, we're dealing with systems that have very slow rates of movement. And so one of the big issues, of course, is actually thinking about not just a five-year time frame for looking at impacts, but a 50-year time frame or more. Because these systems are very, very slow moving. And some of the, na the nature of changes in terms of how much water is being extracted for things like CSG, we're changing the natural pressures in the system. So there will be impacts. It's a matter of how much, where, and what those impacts are, I guess. And so, again, depending on you know, the data and other things, and that's why I deliberately chose two graphs. One where you can show the graph where there's no impact yet, and another graph where you've got clearly some impacts. Um, but that's only over the, the five years that we've been monitoring. I think a lot of these systems will take a lot longer to, to reach their new position or their new equilibrium, um, and then we'll see. So, and I think these are a lot of the real concerns, and it's uh, not a simple question, it's not easy, and in a lot of ways, that's why I think, rather than just going into you know, rapid, massive-scale development, I think we should be slowing down a bit and actually studying these things a lot better than we have in the past. Uh, as I mentioned, when we're looking at, um, at projects like coal seam gas, they are complex. They are inherently difficult things to try and uh, to, to assess. It requires a lot of work, a lot of drilling, um, regular sampling and monitoring. Um, and hist historically, we haven't really been doing that very well. And as much of that is a, a problem with the regulators and government agencies as it is by the industry. And certainly, when um, I was pointing out um, to the Community Consultative Committee in, uh, in Broke in the Hunter Valley um, a couple of years ago that you know, there's the, the Camden coal seam gas project, which is an AGL one. Um, they weren't even monitoring groundwater. And AGL said, oh, but we're meeting all of our statutory obligations. Said, well, sure. But you're making claims about no impacts on groundwater when you don't even have any monitoring boards. You don't even have any basic data to underpin that claim. Um, and even if the regulators don't force you to do it, they'll actually just go out and do it. If the community's asking these important questions, and they are important questions, then we need to get basic data to prove that. And I think, for me, when I look at a lot of things, it's, um, you know, I don't believe in this mantra that, uh, whether it's the financial industry or a whole bunch of other areas, where if there's no data, there's no problem. I think, to me, when I look at the heart of whether it's you know, sustainable groundwater management, resource management, farming, or other things, give me good data to prove there's no problem. And I think that should be the mantra of which we really use. And, it's, um, and I think the regulators and certainly uh, a whole bunch of different areas of the mining industry are still learning you know, about that. So. Um, We've already mentioned that we're changing pressures, so sometimes that can actually change where, where water flows. Um, if you introduce hydraulic fracturing and the cracks um, you know, get through um, the aquitards, then that can actually induce flow where there was none before. Right. One of the things that has already been touched on as well is generally um, a lot of the produced water that comes along with coal seam gas is generally salty, often has other things in it as well, whether it be heavy metals or organics like the, the so-called BTEX chemicals, the benzene, toluene and others. Um, and that's got to be managed. So um, we can see examples, especially in America, the sort of the famous gaslands type stuff where you can get concentrations of methane build up in groundwater. Um, and that can be quite dangerous. Right. Um, as I mentioned, people out here are very dependent on groundwater, whether it's the GAB, whether it's uh, in other parts of Australia, and um, Alice Springs, it's the Marini sandstone. Um, so a lot of communities are very sensitive to actually what, what might happen with their groundwater, and that's, that's a fair thing. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, the Duke Uni, um, Duke University, uh, actually went and looked at a lot of these bores, you know, and sort of said, well, we're getting these claims that are being shown in gas lands where you've got people who can light a flame to their drinking water tap. Um, what's the evidence? Get the data. So they did, they, they published it um, about a year ago now, I think it was. Um, and industry here has always said, oh, but that's shale, it's not coal seam. It's like, well, still the same basic issues. So, and what they did is they looked at areas around sort of Pennsylvania and um, you know, upstate New York. Right. Uh, and what they're able to show is that the closer you are to a shale gas bore, generally there's a higher chance you've got of uh, higher concentrations of methane than existed prior um, to, say, any of the, the shale gas operations. And they're able to show also, and they're about a, a kilometre down, one and a half kilometres down in terms of where the, sh uh, the Marcellus Shale is. Um, but they're able to show very clearly that the methane that's in some of these groundwater bores that people use for their drinking water is clearly um, methane that's coming from the Marcellus Shale. Now, this paper only showed actually that the, the methane was from the Marcellus Shale. It didn't actually answer the question of how it got there. 
And I think Ned was saying last night that it's probably leaking bores or poorly constructed bores. Um, but that's significant. You know, maybe the standards in America aren't as good as the way we do it here. Or, you know, I think that's an open question. But um, clearly they're able to show, if we look at, um, this is just a, a cross section, um, you can see the sort of little grey um, thing down the bottom there, that's the Marcellus Shale, that's what the you know, BHB Billiton have just paid $16 billion to buy um, one of the big operators there. Um, and you can see the sort of, we've got the Catskill formation on the right hand side there, where people have got shallow groundwater bores. And somehow we're getting gas from the deep to the Marcellus Shale up into these shallow groundwater bores. So when you're looking at it in terms of the actual um, as a function of distance, we can see the sort of uh, methane concentrations. We can see typically that, you know, for most sites they're pretty low. But if you're pretty close to a shale gas bore, you can see that sometimes methane concentrations go up extremely high. And hence the basic, you know, one of the basic sort of um, you know, criticisms of a you know, documentary like Gaslands is, oh, but it, it can't happen. It's not possible. Well, the research is finally starting to catch up and actually get good data behind these issues and not just sort of, you know, claim or counterclaim. Um, that's not to say that just because you've got a, you know, um, a, a shale gas bore very close that it, you're going to get methane. There's clearly a bunch of bores there that don't have high methane. Um, so it's a complex picture. It's not easy at all. all right. So I've always argued when looking at a lot of things like coal seam gas that I think, um, and there are issues around uh, the, the different chemicals that are used for fracking or hydraulic fracturing. Um, and I think, you know, I'd sort of actually agree with Tor and others that some of those chemicals are quite benign and, and so on. But a lot of these things also depend on context. People say, oh, it's just like, um, you know, sort of bicarbonate soda and it's just like, not a problem. Yeah, but I don't pour bicarbonate soda into my coffee every time I have a coffee every day. So a lot of these things always depend on context, where they are in the environment, what's happening to them. And when they've injected um, the fracking chemicals, 100% is never recovered. You might get 80% or others, but you're never going to get all of it. Right, so it's a matter of context where these things sit, um, what their pathways are, and so on. So, so a lot of these things, when we're looking at things like groundwater, um, problems when my mum grew up in northern Victoria near Pyramid Hill, when land clearing occurred and so on, um, took several decades later until we actually understood the fact that that land clearing has caused things like dry land salinity. And that's just the nature of the slow-moving beast of groundwater. It takes ages sometimes for the Australian environment to find that new equilibrium. And so sometimes if we're not thinking about these processes and monitoring properly, um, we're never going to understand what these impacts and what these risks are. So I think we've still got a long way to go with that. And certainly it's been very good over the last few years to see that much greater emphasis on the need for, for monitoring, transparency around monitoring, um, and a lot more independence of the science. I think that's certainly, um, historically, that hasn't been done very well. So I think, sure, TSG works, it's, you know, the companies can, can make a lot of money, it can supply gas into you know, um, you know, places in uh, Brisbane or elsewhere so we can all turn the stove on. Um, but we've got to be mindful of the risk we're taking, whether it's risks around groundwater, whether it's risks around the fact that if we're pumping so much money into, into CSG, um, we're still not necessarily dealing with things such as climate change and, um, and so on as well. So a lot of those issues um, can't be answered yet, I think we need a lot more data, a lot more years of work before we can really start to be very, very confident that um, what are the true extent of risk. So, um, so to me, I think that you know, those sorts of issues still need to be uh, looked at a lot more. Just some quick acknowledgements and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you.